I'm Corbett Wall with DB Auction here with your feeder flash for Tuesday March the 31st brought to you entirely by DV Auction. I want to talk to you a little bit about our production sales. That's our bread and butter. We do a lot of production sales and right here in the meat of the production sales season I want to give you a rundown of kind of what we did last week on our uh, production cattle sales had over 8,000 bids just last week on the sales that we uh, broadcast over the internet well over 1400 lots were sold on there adding up to almost five million dollars in in purchases on our, uh, the sales that that we broadcast over the internet with DV auction uh, your video catalogs and that's the way a lot of people shop for bulls is online on our video catalogs we can take care of that for you a lot of the sales we do don't actually run bulls through the ring anymore they sell them off a big screen TV there and they don't take a chance on getting one hurt or having one kind of blow up in the ring when he's really uh, tame and, and shouldn't be doing that but uh, look on the video catalogs 4400 lots on our video catalogs uh, 36,750 catalog views and 340,000 video plays on our, our video catalogs there with DV Auction for our production cattle sales. But on to our commercial cattle markets, what matters? Uh, everybody's kind of wondering uh, what we should look at to, to see the indication of what the market's going to do. Uh, here, before we got into this coronavirus deal and in the early stages of it, we kind of looked at the stock market and it seemed like the, the stock market and the cattle market were kind of tied together and uh, when one went up the other one did too and vice versa. But uh, man, since we've gotten to the full brunt of this uh, coronavirus deal and then we've seen the packers gouging uh, the consumers on one end, manipulating the market for your cattle there and taking all the profits. Uh, there out of the middle it, this thing has just really went crazy so what are we supposed to look at to give us some indication of what the market's going to do do we look at the fundamentals well we, we've uh, we've had record beef sales here in the last two or three weeks since we've had the panic buying coming in uh, we've had a huge huge slaughter last week uh, 675,000 thereabouts that is huge huge slaughter there uh, do we look at that? Uh, do we look at uh, the fact that we don't have a whole lot of cattle that are market ready on the show list? We have a lot of cattle on feed that are going to be hitting the show list as we get into the summer months. Uh, our, our feeder cattle and, and especially our grazing cattle calf numbers are down quite a bit. And so do we look at that and try to think that offsetting that we should, uh, we should be looking into higher prices? Your fundamentals don't matter when we get into a wreck like this. Uh, do we look at the beef trade? You know, uh, we, we've uh, talked about how our, our box beef cutout values reached record levels record fast there uh, week before last. And, and it was just amazing, you know, gaining uh, 47, 48 bucks a hundred on your choice cutouts. I mean, it's just amazing to get that. Your Packers kept all that profit there. Uh, then what do we do? Do we look at the board? Uh, the board is so sporadic uh, that there's no telling of which way it's going to go. And with this algorithmic uh, trading, it just, as soon as it starts to go one way or the other, it just goes completely limit moves and it's just back and forth and up and down. Nobody can keep track of that and it's, it's uh, very uh, confusing to try to do that. Do we look at the technicals that a lot of your uh, technical analysts look at, which, uh, uh, like it or not, they, they do work a lot of the time. But when we're in a pandemic, when we're in a crisis, uh, when we're in a wreck, uh, when the uh, Packers are taking so much advantage, uh, they've got all the leverage and they're making all the rules, uh, your technicals don't ring true. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the panic mode right here. And, uh, you know, just because we've got a head and shoulders or we've got a gap or something like that doesn't mean that, that uh, it's going to get filled or doesn't mean uh, that, that everybody's going to trade the same way because because a lot of your technical analysts have lost uh, confidence in those in those charts and so they're not all playing them. It really doesn't matter what they do if everybody reads them the same way and, and uh, reacts to them the same way, then they work. But, but folks aren't reading them and they aren't reacting to them the same way, so they're not working. But uh, we just, uh, you know, 
if we want to get right down to it, and I preach it and I preach it and I preach it, we don't have enough negotiated cash sales of fed cattle in the five area feeding region uh, to, to make a market uh, that, that uh, the rest of the 80 or 85 percent can be priced upon. And, and that is the problem. Everybody talks about uh, these different things that are hurting the market. Yeah, we're, we're importing beef. We, we import and export with countries all over. And, uh, and we're going to continue to do that. That's part of the way that we get along with everybody. We're going to continue to do that. Uh, you know, trying to figure out ways to, to get uh, uh, consumers to, to appreciate the product more. Maybe, you know, some truth in labeling. Yeah, that would be great. But what what makes anybody think that a label is going to make going to help our cattle business? Uh, we have outstanding demand for our beef. Over the last two or three weeks, how often has there been a, a stick of any kind of a decent beef cut in your shelves to buy? No, everybody wants the beef. We don't have a problem with beef demand. Don't get excited about that. Don't think people aren't buying stuff because they don't want it. No, they absolutely want it. We've got to keep the shelves full. We've got to find a way to get a larger percentage of that uh, retail price uh, as a cattle feeder, as a cattle producer, as a cow-calf man. How do we do that? We've got to get some more uh, leverage in the trade. We've got to, to do something. Uh, the, these packers have taken so much advantage of, of the way that the system is set up. It plays all the way in their favor. Uh, you know they've, they've uh, you know they totally gouged your consumer and maybe it's the retailer that they've gouged but they've got kind of a consistent markup on the product that they get it's your packers that are gouging uh, your retailers and then they're having to pass it on to the consumers and I guarantee you like I've said before when a couple of housewives are fighting over the the last stick of hamburger meat or they're like uh, fighting over the last uh, ribeyes they're, they're not looking at the price on there, guys. They're just, they're just sticking it in a cart and they're rushing up to the clerk and they're, and they're heading home. So we don't have a problem there. Who has the authority to do something about this? We've heard everybody talk about it, from the Secretary of Agriculture to some of our best uh, agriculture senators. Uh, Charles Grassley, he's been an icon, a legend as an ag senator uh, in Iowa there, and he's always been involved in that. Sent out a tweet letting everybody know that he knows exactly what the problem is. He knows what's going on. If you guys haven't, haven't seen that, look it up, but he knows it's the Packers that are keeping all of it. Okay, if he knows it, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture knows it, maybe the President doesn't know it, but he's kind of busy right now, if you guys haven't noticed. But there should be somebody down the line that should be able to do something about it. And, the, and then threats aren't going to work, right? Threats aren't going to work. Cargill is bigger than the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So is Tyson. So is JBS. They're bigger. Now, now, they may have to follow the rules, but we've got to find somebody to go in there and enforce those rules. It's sure not going to be the Packers and Stockyards Administration or what's left of it. They're not going to enforce those rules. We've got to find somebody that will do it. You know, we, we got a little bit of threat uh, there uh, a couple of weeks ago or a week and a half ago, and they said they were going to get the Department of Justice involved, and, and they started making a few just uh, surface calls around, you know, spooked the, the Packers a little bit, and, and Tyson threw an extra five bucks on uh, to the cattle that they'd already uh, purchased. Now, and I mentioned that on the last visit, if that's not admitting guilt, what is it? And just like I said the last time, it, it's like the cops, they, they catch somebody robbing a bank red-handed, pull them over outside of town and tell the guys, I saw you rob that bank. And then the, the guy denies it and then reaches over and grabs the big money bag with the, with the die uh, all over the money and says, here, have a couple of thousand dollars here. Uh, but it wasn't me. I didn't do it. They absolutely know that they've done it. It's so blatant. We can see it in, in our uh, reported markets. Uh, they weren't able to hide the gains that we saw in our box beef cutout value because your retailers were hand to mouth and they needed product right now. 
So they had to buy it on the spot, immediate delivery market. We saw every bit of the rise in it. We saw the fat cattle market go down. Uh, we saw them make all that money. Uh, they, they were making pretty decent money before all this coronavirus still hit. And then in one week, they gained an extra 400 on top of their profits already before, making over $600 per head or per carcass. It's not that your cattle guys were excited about taking advantage of a crisis or a pandemic. They just wanted a fair piece of the pie. And, and, I, and guys say, well, we need to tie it to the cutout values. I don't know that we need to tie it to the cutout values. Your packers absolutely uh, dictate the price on there. They set the price on those cutout values. It's the volume that tells you everything about those cutout values. They can manipulate the cutout values even easier than they can manipulate the, the fat cattle market. And you think, well, why don't the, the feedlots, uh, the guys that are selling their fat cattle, why don't they ask more? Well, that's a good idea. But if they ask more, then they're in fear of packer retaliation, which is, is another thing that's against the, uh, the rules when you're talking about fair trade. But, uh, you know, saying this week, what if we had somebody come out and say, I think we need to get that market back up there pretty good. How about a buck 30 for my cattle? You think he's going to get another call back this week? We haven't uh, puked any cattle yet this week. It's coming. Sometime here today on Tuesday, somebody's going to puke some cattle because they're going to look at that basis. They won't be able to resist it. And you're thinking, what's the basis? Well, they hedged those cattle. When they made the hedge, they were, they were betting on the fat cattle market to go down. They were basically setting the price of what they were. If, if, the, you know, if there was market went up, they'd, they'd gain that ground in the cash market to, on the, the real asset that they had. If it went down, uh, they'd make it back on their, on their hedges because they bet on the market to go down. You think, why in the hell would anybody in the cattle business bet on the market to go down? Basically, as an insurance policy. So, so usually about the only money there is to be made is the basis which is the difference between the cash and your spot futures market. And whenever your cash is higher, uh, that's basically the bonus or, or what, they, what they get to keep as a profit there. Well, our April live cattle futures, uh, you know, settled at, at 99.20 on Monday. Okay, the last established fat cattle market was 120. And you think, well, gosh, that's not a very good indicator of what the market is. No shit. And so we're looking down the line. Now we've got our out front fat cattle selling way down in the 80s somewhere. And then you look at your, your, your feeder cattle futures. If you look at the corresponding month of the feeder cattle futures as to when those cattle will come out, those feeder cattle, if they were bought at the feeder cattle futures price, won't hedge. And uh, so, you know, it takes some guys buying some, some planer type cattle, buying some cattle under the market, and, and, uh, and using some risk management schemes, which is over the head of, of most of your smaller producers. And, uh, it, it, you know, like I say, why don't you ask more for cattle? Because if you don't kind of get in line and behave, those packers will retaliate against you. And not only will you not get the cattle you have on the show list this week sold, you may not get any sold for several weeks. And if you think they don't do that, just ask around. Absolutely. I tell you, there's some big, tough, strong guys that feed a lot of uh, cattle in the five area feeding region that are scared to death of packer retaliation. And, and uh, you know, and, and they feel like they're tattling if they try to, to do anything about it. But we can't seem to find anybody that where the buck stops where we can try to get something done. Your basis jumpers, just like I was talking about a while ago, there'll be some here on Tuesday. If not Tuesday, for sure Wednesday, there'll be some basis jumpers. I wish they'd hold their hand up where everybody can see them because once they take the, the, the meager price that the Packers are offering, uh, because of that basis, because they've hedged those cattle, that basically sets the market and everybody else has to follow suit. If, if they buck it, then they're going to stand uh, packer retaliation. But the heck of it is, these, these hedgers and these basis jumpers continue to paint themselves into a corner. They've gotten to it right now. They can't buy any decent feeder cattle that will hedge. 
And so they just keep letting market position go and market position go until they keep getting the price lower and lower. And they don't really care what the price is. It's all about the basis. That's all they really want. But the people that are raising those cattle, your cow-calf producers, the guys that, that, are, that are buying uh, your, your lightweight turnout cattle and, and uh, renting the grass or using their own grass and growing those cattle, they need a decent price for those cattle. Or your cow-calf producer can't afford to produce them anymore. And, and your backgrounder can't afford the expenses that it takes him to make the green yearlings that everybody wants to buy. And then he knows he can't afford to feed the cattle because that's not his game. That feeding cattle is a rich man's game as it is anyway. And you better be uh, in a sweetheart deal with your packer or you're going to go broke. But uh, this coronavirus deal is, is breaking a lot of people in this United States. It's breaking people that own restaurants. It's, it's breaking people that, that own all types of businesses. But it's going to break a, a, a higher percentage of, uh, of ranchers. You know, and we talk about the farmers too. It's hard on the farmers. But it's fallen in a time right here where, where they're just busy uh, doing their thing. They can still get out there. They're exempt. They can go out and, and they can put fertilizer down. They can start getting their crops planted here early this spring. They can still do their stuff. It hasn't interrupted their marketing. But on your cattle producers, I mean from your, from your independent cattle feeders to your growers or backgrounders and your, and your cow-calf producers, it has broken them. And, and they won't be around anymore. And so there's that fewer of them, and our vertical integration just keeps uh, getting uh, more straight up and down. And that's where we're at. And, and when we, we keep losing that to vertical integration, we lose our, our farm, our ranch communities. Uh, we, we lose uh, the backbone of this country. And, and we got to find somebody that will stand up. You know, I can bark on this uh, YouTube video uh, every day. And, and pe people listen to it and they say, man, you're right. Or, or, you know, go get them or whatever. What good does it do? I don't have any pull. We need to find somebody that does. Somebody that swings a big enough stick to get something done and they've got to be tied in with the government. We've got to find somebody. Like I just said, if the Secretary of Agriculture knows it, can't get anything done about it. Uh, if he's talking to his justice system, it, the problem with getting somebody like that involved in it, your Department of Justice, they don't understand it. There's just a very, very few people that really know what are going on around here. I've said it all the time. There's cowboys everywhere. All across this country is full of, uh, of cowboys. The bars are full of them. The roping arenas are full of them. Uh, those kind of people, are they're, they're everywhere. But there's not very many people that know anything about cows, uh, the cattle market, the cattle business, or, or how it all works. There's not very many of them. You try to get somebody outside it to do something about uh, what's going on, they don't understand it. Uh, that, that was a great thing about, uh, uh, you know, being in college and being an ag major. When you got into English, just write something about, uh, about the cattle market or, or something that just completely goes over the professor's head. And, you, you know, they give you a pretty good grade on it and you go right along. And I know you guys have done it too, those of you that went to college. I know I did. But let's look at the board for Monday. April live cattle futures down a buck seventy-five. 99.20. Remember, our last established live fat cattle price is 120, and our spot April. It's April tomorrow, guys, and our spot live cattle futures contract is 99.20. Pretty good indicator. June live cattle futures down 35 cents at 89.07. Another 10 bucks back from there. The rest uh, of your out fronts there. Uh, we're mostly higher, but just slightly. April feeder cattle futures down 55 cents at 120 and a half. Okay, you look at that 120 and a half, and it's not what everybody wants. We'd like to have those those uh, feeder cattle futures up there around a buck 40 and or somewhere in there. We've got some cash sales at around buck 30, and we're right here in the spot market. But our our, our nearby futures is a buck 20 and change. Well. What, what does some April feeder cattle look like? Well, let's tie them up to uh, when they'll finish in October there. That, that October live cattle futures is 94.40. 
Well, if you use a conservative gain on there, cost of gain, including all your expenses, including freight, uh, shrink to get them where they're going, and, and everything it takes to get them finished up at about 85 cents, you need a dollar five. You need a dollar five to, for those cattle to wash. And your October live cattle futures are 94 and a half, not quite. That doesn't work. The guys have painted themselves into a corner. May feeder cattle down two cents at 120.90. All of them were down except for uh, some of your 2021 feeder cattle futures, and they were down really hard because they were still at a respectable level. But let's look at the weighted average on last week's negotiated fed cattle trade in your five area feeding region. 89,500 head. That's a pretty respectable movement. That's uh, close to 20% of, of uh, your total movement for, for the week last week. Uh, that's not enough. What we're asking for uh, with the group that I've been kind of working with, trying to push this uh, minimum level of negotiated cash trade, we want 30%. We think that's, that's, that's uh, low enough, 30%. You know, is, is that uh, unreasonable to say that 30% of the cattle should be negotiated on so 70% can be priced off that 30? I don't think that's unreasonable. I think that would save the industry. I absolutely do. We're trying to get something going, trying to get something wrote up uh, so, so you guys that listen to this and care can get behind it and push it. And, and call the right people. But 89,500 last week negotiated cash, compared that to the week before the, the total wreck there, 131,300 head. Your packers can buy that many. They can buy them. And, and guys can sell them. There's that many cash cow out on the market if they'll just do it. I don't think the 30% would get into the, uh, the contract formulas that your big corporate feeders have. Uh, I think they could get behind it too because it's going to give them a better base price to start with. Going to make them more profitable. If they'll just let some of these smaller independent uh, cattle feeders live. But that 89.5 uh, compares to 75,700 the same week a year ago. Your, your prices on a live basis last week on fat steers and heifers range from 112 all the way to 122, but mostly 118 to 120. Your weighted average live steer price was 119.31. That was up $9.41, yet everybody's in a downer mood. Your dressed uh, sales of steers and heifers range from 180 all the way to 191, mostly 190. And your dressed weighted average for steers last week was 188.88, up $15.75. And we're still struggling and everybody's in a downer mood. And we've got the boards, uh, you know, not even within uh, $20 of what the damn market is. It's unbelievable. Nationwide, your negotiated cash trade was 103000 And 30% of those were for the two to four week delivery. Now, some of the guys that are pushing for the minimum requirement of cash trade, they want 50% uh, of cash trade there, and they want to throw in the negotiated grids like they're a big deal. Well, last week, negotiated grids made up 20,100 head. That's 4% of about a half a million head movement there, uh, or what we typically kill each week of slaughter steers and heifers. That's not enough to matter. Let's just let that go on off to the side and stick to our 30%. Look at your feeder cattle market, your real-time index on DV auction. Late in the day on Monday at 131.20, down 43 cents compared to the end of last week. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange feeder cattle index on Friday, because that's the latest available. It's always a day, a business day or a day and a half behind, but CME cash feeder cattle index on Friday was 132.57. You think, well, gosh, just the previous Friday, it was 116 and change. Remember, because you had your corporate feeders dump all those cheap directs in, in that index and sucked them way down. We did, by the way, get a picture of some of those cattle that they turned in uh, from 102 to 106 there a week ago. And, and I'm not sure if they quite measure up to the USDA number one and, and mixed ones and twos that they were turned in on or not. But you notice they didn't turn any of those cheap cattle in last week. Well, it didn't behoove them to do it because the board had, had already had settled. 
uh, your feeder cattle, your March feeder cattle board had already settled. They didn't need to take the, the index down. It, it's just total manipulation ever which way you look. You know, I'm not even going to talk about the rumors that some of your packers had uh, had shorted the, or, or had actually bought the board, excuse me, uh, bought your live cattle futures right before they gave the little token uh, bump and then rode it up there up the limit for two or three days and then rode it down two or three days when they all got out. Now, whether that happened or not, I don't know, but it sure would not surprise me a bit. But... Let's look at your big sales uh, for Monday. Oklahoma City, Oklahoma National Stockyards, you know, a lot of the producers in North Texas there and over in the meat of Oklahoma, they thought, gosh almighty, you know, we had a good market there a week ago. Let's have enough confidence to bring those cattle in. They started shipping those cattle on uh, late in the week last week. And I'll be damned if, if all the, the moods and, and all the, uh, the, the drive that we had in the market had went away by Friday and uh, they kind of knew that they were stung but they needed to move those cattle feeder cattle selling four to ten bucks lower in oklahoma city uh your stalker cattle of course we need a lot of stalker cattle two to three dollars lower and i tell you what not going to be as many cattle put out on on grass as normal in fact a lot of your guys that typically run cattle out on your lease pastures and the flint hills the osage and and uh, the foothills of the Rockies, some, some major grazing areas there, they, they've never got a chance to put any cattle together. You know, this pandemic come in right in the middle of it and, and there was so much uncertainty in there, they didn't get any cattle put together. There's a lot of pasture available out there that's really hard to find to get to lease. And, uh, and guys may not be able to get them out there. There's a lot of, of those uh, stalker calves that are still in firm hands because those guys had a, a really good product there. They had lightweight calves in the early springtime. They're supposed to get paid for those. Well, this, this uh, coronavirus killed that. Those guys are still hanging on to those cattle and a lot of your backgrounders and your grazers have not been able to put cattle together and they're not gonna have any cattle ready to turn out this year. But uh, if you listen to Bailey Blue, uh, the auctioneer, one of the auctioneers there at Oklahoma National Stockyards, he does a, 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 a video uh, similar to what I'm doing right here. He was talking on there about how sporadic the feeder cattle market was. And it was really hard for him as an auctioneer and, and uh, a watcher of the market to, to tell within 10 or $15 a hundred of what the cattle might bring despite knowing what they weigh and how they look and being right there to market than when they just had some cattle sell right above that. But if you've got these guys that are trying to hedge those cattle as they go, the, 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 the board's just going up and down and up and down, not a little bit, but dollars and dollars, and, and they just don't know what to do. They don't know, you know, how, how do they buy cattle and protect them on there when everything's moving around like that. It's unbelievable. Joplin Regional Stockyard, 6,900 head there, steady to $7 lower. Russell Livestock in Russell, Iowa had about 1,400 head there. Look at the uh, automated market report from DV Auction there on Cattle Market Central. You see your most popular weights of steers. Uh, 190 head of the six weight steers, average 641 at 149.69. 410 head of the seven weight steers, average 741 at 138.52. 146 head of the eight weight steers averaged 861 at 126.35 on the weighted average price. And the best tested weight of heifers was the six weights with 148 heifers averaging 653 at 131.61. Got a few individual quotes there. Platte Valley Livestock in Gary, Nebraska, 131 head of the stalker steers weighing 479 at $186. That's a respectable quote. Aberdeen Livestock Sales in Aberdeen, South Dakota, 50 head of 704 pound steers bring 154.50. And then F&T Livestock Market, Palmyra, Missouri, 62 head of 838 pound steers bring 134 and a half. And that's your feeder flash for Tuesday.